Welcome to the Marisi Pet Care Channel. Today I want to go over something that's very important. I want to help you know what you can do when you find a lost dog. We've probably all come across them. A dog gets out of a house, it gets loose, and it's running around the neighborhood, running across the street, and you're worried that the dog is going to get hurt, and rightfully so, because most dogs that get out will get hurt, or they'll never be seen again by their owners. It could be out for any number of reasons, but whatever the reason, you have it in your heart that you want to help this dog. Well, the first thing that you want to do is you want to have a little bit, if you can, you want to have a little bit of planning that goes into the fact that this will happen before you get in your car. What do I mean by that? I keep a pet first aid kit in my trunk and I keep a couple of spare leashes. I'm a dog owner. I'm also a dog walker. And let me tell you, I've used those spare leashes many times. I've used the pet first aid kit uh, several times. It comes in handy. If you have a dog, if you know people with dogs, it's nice to be prepared. And I'm all about being prepared. So I have those things in my car. If you don't have those things, there are workarounds, but those things will make it easier for you. So you're, you're driving around in your car and you see a dog run across the street. You look around, you don't see any owners. And so what I would do is I'd pull over, you know, pull out of traffic so that cars can keep going. And before you jump out of your car and run after the dog, which is the worst thing you can do, pull over and just look at the dog. Is the dog limping? Is it trying to hide? Is it, does it seem afraid? You know, know a little bit about dog body language if you can. And just kind of see what's going on with the dog. Is it being chased by something? You know, in, in my area, we have coyotes, we have mountain lions, we have dogs that get loose. So you just need to take a minute and see what's going on. A lot of times if you're out walking your own dog, stray dogs will run up to you because they're attracted to your dogs. And that's never a good thing because, you know, depending on your dog, your dog could get attacked, your dog could attack the other dog. It's just not a good mix, but often that will happen. Going back to the first scenario, you're driving along, you see the dog, you look at it, it doesn't appear to be hurt. It seems fairly relaxed, it's running, looks like it's running around having fun. That's the first scenario. That's, the, that's a good scenario. Now, a dog that's out running around having fun doesn't necessarily want to be caught, but it is in their best interest. So we're going to try and catch them anyway. If the dog is aggressive or scared or snarling or barking, if its ears are pinned back and its eyes are bugged out and its tail is tucked behind its legs, or if its tail is up and wagging really fast and nervously, that, that's not a happy tail. That's a nervous tail. That's a dog you want to approach with caution if you approach it at all. If you're afraid that the dog might be aggressive, don't approach it. Dogs can sense when you're afraid and they, re they can react badly. A dog that is normally nice to everybody will bark and lunge at a, at a person that's afraid of it. They, they know. So if you're afraid of the dog, don't even try. But if you can keep an eye on it and call animal control, that's going to be your best bet. If you have somebody else in the car with you, Two people make it easier than one as long as you can both agree on the same type of approach to the dog. Never chase the dog. The reason you don't want to ever chase the dog is because that will make the dog instinctively want to run away from you. You don't want that. You want to be able to catch the dog. So if you start approaching the dog and it starts taking off and running, don't run after it. What I would do in that case is I'd get back in my car and I'd continue to follow the dog. The dog will tire eventually and, and it'll make it easier for you to catch it. This is where your spare leash comes in handy. You want to grab your spare leash and hopefully, I mean, ideally it would be a slip lead. Slip leads are the best for this task because they don't have a clip and you, you're not touching the dog's collar. You're just going to make a loop on the end of the leash and put it over the dog's head and then pull it tight and that will keep the dog from being able to run away. And I'll, and I'll show you how you can do a makeshift slip lead right now. Let's say that you don't have a regular slip lead. You have a standard leash, like the one you use for your own dog, and it's got a clip on one end like this, and it's got a handle on the other end. You know, just your basic, everyday leash. Yeah. Right? Okay, so what you want to do, what you want to do in a case like that, is you want to take the side that has the, the clip in front of it, and the loop, put, the, put this through the handle, and now basically what you've done is you've made a slip lead. So you've got this big hoop. And this big hoop is really easy to put over a dog's head. 
like I just did with Betty. So now you're like, but I can't hold on to this clip part. Well, that's easy. This particular one has two handles, but let's pretend it didn't. All you have to do is tie a regular old knot, put your hand through the hole, and then hold that part with your hand. Now you can make it a little tighter. That dog's not going anywhere. It's looped around its neck. If it pulls, it gets tighter. It's not going to slip out of that like it would a regular flat collar and leash. Right, Betty? And you've got a good hold on it. And now you can get this dog in your car. You can get it to where it needs to be to, to be able to be rescued. Right? All right? Let me show you that one more time. It's, it's really easy. So you've got the handle part here. You've got the clip part here. You make a loop out of it. Put it over the dog's head. Now you got now you got the dog. Now I got the dog. And the dog's not going anywhere, is it? You're not going anywhere. So that's all you do. Now, let's say you come up on this dog, but it looks hurt. Instead of it being a happy dog that's out running around playing in the neighborhood, it's a dog that got maybe hit by a car or attacked by other dogs or something. The dog's injured and it's hurt and it's laying down. Well, what you want to do in that case is before you approach the dog, you want to grab a muzzle. And if you've got a first aid kit for dogs, you've got a muzzle. If you don't have a muzzle and you've got a couple spare leashes, what you do with that dog first is you want to make a knot. You want to make a muzzle. You can make a muzzle out of a leash or a, or a thin belt. So you take the leash and you make a loop and make it pretty big, okay? And you're gonna take this knot, sit, and you're going to put it over the dog. And then you're gonna snap it down pretty quickly. The dog's not gonna like it, especially if it's do a dog that's not used to being muzzled. Betty's not used to being muzzled, so she doesn't care for it. Now, you wanna take behind the ears and make another knot. Then you take the clip part, and you tuck it under the front there. It's not as easy with the leash as it is with the muzzle. And then you take that back and you tie it again. Okay, and that's how you make a muzzle. It's really easy. Okay, you take this off of Betty now. That's a good girl. That's a good girl, Betty. Okay, so what you basically want to do, you'd be better off if you did it halfway through. You just make a knot. You take this loop, put it over the dog's muzzle. Then you take these two parts, tie them behind the head, like that. And then you take one long tail, put it under the muzzle on the front here, and then pull it back. That, dog's, that dog is safe now. Now that it, the dog is muzzled, and if you have a regular muzzle, it's a lot easier to do with, than with the leash, but it can be done with the leash. You can also do it with a tie. You know, if you're on your way to work or from work, you can use a tie for that. And you can also use a belt. But you wanna muzzle the dog. If you have spare muzzles in your first aid kit, that's easier, you just you know stick it over the dog's muzzle. The reason you wanna make sure that the dog is muzzled is because an injured dog, even if it's your own dog, may bite you. And if the dog bites you and attacks you, you can't help it. So you wanna make sure that you're safe and that the dog is gonna be safe because if you get hurt, you can't help the dog and then the dog could die. So even if you have your own dog, and I learned this the hard way, I once had a Labrador and he was a great dog, um, but he used to like to jump on the fence, our wooden slat fence, and bark at the dog on the other side of the fence. And one time, the slats lined up like this. Well, one time when he was jumping with his paws, one of his paws slipped between the two slats and it got stuck and he panicked and it was squishing his, his wrist. So I ran out there to save him. You know, it was my dog. I felt completely comfortable with him. Well, when I went to reach his paw and pull on it, he bit me and his tooth went all the way through my hand. And he didn't mean to do that. I mean, he was, I ended up in the emergency room. I had to get a tetanus shot. I had to get a couple stitches. 
they had to, you know, they had to clean out my wound. And, you know, I did get his paw out, but, and then he was so sorry afterwards. But, you know, that was my fault because I should have muzzled him first. If I had muzzled him first and then pulled his paw out, you know, he, he would have been um, safe faster and I wouldn't have been bit. So that's why you did the muzzle. And I've learned this from getting bit by my own dog. And a dog that doesn't know you is even more likely to bite you if it's hurt or if it's sick. So do the muzzle. Now, you've got the dog. You've got it leashed up. You know, so maybe you don't have a leash. I've had dogs that were so friendly and happy and you could tell they had collars on and they had a little tag on. You could see that they had been loved by somebody. With a dog like that, if I'm in my car, the first thing I'm, that I'm gonna try, especially if the dog comes up to me, because a lot of them will, is I'll open the car door and I'll say, you wanna go for a ride? And I'll use my happiest voice and I'll say like, hey, you wanna go for a ride? You know what those dogs do? Nine times out of 10, they jump in the car. And so it's, it's, it's actually really easy with a dog like that. No, we're not going for a ride. I'm talking to other people about going for a ride. No, we're not. This dog, she knows what a ride is. Don't you? We're not going. I know. You should see her face. Such a sad face. I know. No, we're not going. No. Sit. Sit, Betty. You got, you've got the dog either leashed or free in your car because it was an easy, gentle dog. So what do you do next? If the dog has a collar, call the number on the collar. You know, if, if it's your dog and you wanna make sure that if it ever gets out, you find it, you've gotta have your name and phone number on the dog. The other thing that you wanna make sure that you do is you wanna make sure that you have a microchip in your dog. Because if this dog doesn't have a collar, if, you know, maybe it slipped out of its collar, it got caught on a bush or caught on a fence, or maybe someone tried to grab its collar and the dog, you know, did that little thing that dogs do and it got out of its collar, may not have its collar. So if the dog doesn't have its collar, then the next step that I would recommend, because you're not, you're not gonna have a number to call, would be to go to your local vet. You can call ahead of time and say, hey, I've got this dog that I found. Can you scan, do you have time to scan it for, for me? Most of the time they will. And so, or the, or the local shelter, you can do that too. And I'll get to that in a moment. So if you don't have a, a phone number to call, your next step is gonna be to get that dog scanned. Once you get it scanned, if they have a microchip, then they're gonna have the name number and you know the name and number of the owner and they'll be able to call the owner that way. Nine times out of 10, when you find a dog, it has an owner and it's really easy to reunite the owner if you just know what steps to take. Now, if your vet is too busy and they don't have time to scan them, the shelters will. And most people, the last thing that they wanna do is take a cute dog to a shelter. And I get that because the shelters have a bad reputation for euthanizing dogs and it's more than a reputation. It's unfortunately, it's a fact in many cities. But the first place that I would look for my dog if it was lost was the shelter. And my dogs are chipped, I'm gonna go get them. And by law, dogs are property. They belong to someone else. And so it is your legal responsibility if you find a dog to, to surrender it to the local shelter. And when I say local shelter, I mean the closest shelter to where you found the dog. And this is really important. The reason this is important is because people have taken vacations and been hundreds of miles from home, found a lost dog, taken it home. I don't know why, but people do these things. And then they take it to the shelter in their town that's hundreds of miles away. How in the world is the owner ever gonna find that dog? They're gonna look near where the dog was. So you have to take it to the shelter near where the dog was found. That is gonna help the real owner find their dog. Their dog could be dirty and it could, it could have been out for, an, for one day and get filthy. They could be matted because the owner couldn't find them. I mean, there's any number of reasons why a dog could look completely neglected and not be. So you have to take it to the local shelter. Now, if you're worried as most people are, that the dog is going to be killed if it's taken to the shelter. The way that it works at, at most shelters, and especially here in particular, because I do know for a fact how it works here, is when you take the dog to the shelter, they put a hold on it for a certain number of days, and nobody can even adopt that dog for a certain number of days because they're giving the, the owner time to find their dog. 
And so for the first however many days, it is ask your shelter because they all vary. You know, if it's a week, with in the case of Eddie, it was a week. He was a, he was a lost dog that my mom found. Well, she, she took him to the local shelter. They vaccinated him. They neutered him. And they said in one week, if the owners haven't come, he's going to be put up for, for adoption. And then after so many more days, then, you know, some shelters will euthanize the dog. So when you take them to the shelter, ask them what their rules are. If they're going to hold them for a week, but you have fallen in love with this dog, as my mom did with Eddie. Let me tell you the story of Eddie. Eddie was a little Chihuahua toy puppy. And... He was running through the neighborhood in Los Angeles where my mom lives, lived. So this little guy was running through the neighborhood and the neighborhood kids were chasing him and he was terrified and he ran into this condo complex and my neighbor Margaret had her door open. It was summertime and it was hot and she just, she would leave her door open sometimes. And she heard a commotion outside and this little puppy ran into her, he was a puppy then, he ran into her house and the neighborhood kids were chasing him and she told them to quit it. She asked, you know, what was going on and they said that, you know, it was a lost dog and they were trying to chase him and they were trying to catch him and she told the kids, she's like, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it from here. Well, he wouldn't let anybody touch him. He was terrified. So he jumped up on her, her chair like the one I'm sitting in and he had been so tired from running from those kids, he just went to sleep. You know, he was a puppy, he was, he was tired anyway. So he, he went to sleep and he didn't let Margaret touch him. He didn't let anybody touch him. My mom lived next door and so she came over and she's like, well, what have you here? And she looked at Eddie and he was awake at the time and he was looking at my mom. And Margaret said, we have this little lost puppy that we found. My mom used to take walks all the time in the neighborhood. So Margaret asked her, have you seen him? walking with anybody, do you have any idea who this cute little puppy might belong to? And she said, no, but I want him. And then my mom reached down and scooped him right up and he let her. He was, she was the first person that he let touch him. And my mom's heart just melted when she met Eddie, she loved him. And so she talked to Margaret. Margaret didn't want to have a dog at the time. And my mom didn't have, had lost her previous dog. And my mom was very interested in having a dog. And she said, I would love to keep him. So what they did was they took him to the local shelter to give the original owners a chance to find him and to, to, to redeem him. And when my mom dropped him off, she told the people at the shelter, if nobody comes for him, I want him. I want to be first on the list to get him because I love him. And they said, okay, but we can't hold him for you because sometimes people say that and they don't come back. So he'll be ready you know, Monday morning at 7 a.m. next week if they don't come for him. So the week passed, they, he got his vaccines and he got neutered and the original owners never came for him. My mom was there right at seven o'clock when the doors opened and she got Eddie. And there were six or seven other people that were waiting on a list that were gonna come later in the day um, to get him because he was adorable. So that's the story of Eddie. But I know that that's how that works. Now, what if you find the dog, but you have no interest in keeping the dog? I'm not gonna make you feel bad for that. I have two dogs. Even if I found a beautiful dog and I wanted to keep it, my HOA rules prohibit me having any more dogs. I'm at my limit right now. And so I can't bring any more dogs home. But if I find a dog and I can't find the owner because the dog doesn't have a tag or it doesn't have a chip, then I'm gonna take it to the shelter and I'm gonna ask them to let me know if nobody comes for the dog. And in the meantime, when I go home without the dog and the dog stays at the shelter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get online and I'm going to get on Facebook and Craigslist and Nextdoor. And I'm going to post pictures of this dog that I took. And I'm going to say which shelter he's at. I'm going to say that I found him, you know, just to, to try and help find that owner. But also what it does is it starts the ball rolling to find him a home if the owners don't come. So let's say a week passes and nobody comes for the dog and they call you and they say, you know, you asked us to call you if nobody came for the dog and nobody has come for the dog. It's like, okay, well, depending on the shelter, they may have an adoption program and they may or may not be a kill shelter. Here in Los Angeles, we're moving more towards no kill shelters, but we're not there 100% yet. 
So if the shelter says, look, we will put him up for adoption and we'll list him for 30 days or one week or whatever the shelter is able to do at that time, I'm going to keep an eye on, on his listing. You know, I'm going to, to keep watching it and like, I'll, I'll go back to my social media posts and I'll say, hey, that cute little dog that I posted last week that I found, the owners never came for him. And, you know, I would appreciate any ideas you have, any rescue connections that you have that may help me find a, a home for this dog. And so, you know, it's, it is a lot of work, but it's a life. And so if you're interested in helping this dog, these are the things that I have done in the past to, to keep a dog from getting euthanized. And so I would go to my social media page. I would, I'm in some dog groups, so I would share it within the dog groups. I'd share it within the neighborhood groups, people that are local. If, if it's a certain type of dog, like if it appears to be a pure breed, like Betty is a pure breed Border Collie as far as I can tell. She was rescued by the Border Collie Rescue Group in the Ozarks because I lived in Arkansas at the time. Eddie, there are Chihuahua rescue groups, there's Bulldog rescue groups, there's German Shepherd rescue groups. For certain breeds, they have rescue groups. And so that's when you want to reach out to these rescue groups and say, hey, I found this adorable dog. It appears to be, you know, a, a Border Collie mix or whatever the breed is. And, you know, do you have any resources to help? And I've done this in the past where I've made 50 phone calls before I found one that was willing to help. And you just keep calling. You know, you call as much as you can in the day and then you stop. And meanwhile, the dog's at the shelter, hopefully being seen and networked. And with a little extra help, you can find the dog a home. Well, what happens if the dog that's lost is yours? These are the tips that I have if you're trying to find your own lost dog. First, make sure your dog is chipped so that if it ever gets lost, they will call you. Make sure that you put a collar on the dog with the name tag. That way, it, you want to make it as easy as possible with as few steps as possible for somebody who finds your dog to get it back to you. So if all they have to do is look at the dog's collar and call the number on it, that's the easiest. Again, collars fall off, so have the chip as a backup. Then, there's a couple different scenarios where, for when the dog is lost. If you if somebody has left a door open or a gate open or your dog dug under the fence, there's a few things that you can do. First, if you have a dog that you leave in the yard by itself, you need to have a bulletproof fence. In many areas, it's not legal depending on the weather, but in some areas it is and the weather could be nice and maybe you only left them back there for 20 minutes or a half an hour. I'm not, there's no judgment here. I'm just saying if you're not gonna be in the backyard with the dog, you need to make sure that your fence is high enough that the dog can't jump or crawl or climb over it. And you need to make sure that if your dog shows any interest whatsoever in digging a hole, that the perimeter of your fence line cannot be dug through. What I mean by that is there's a couple things that you can do for digging. The, the most secure thing that you can do is you can, you can dig a trench all the way around your fence line and put concrete in it. Some type of concrete where at the fence line your dog has a barrier. Something that I did with Betty because when I got her she was an escape artist and I knew that she was a digger was I buried chicken wire. I put scrunched up chicken, I dug a trench all the way around the fence and I buried chicken wire under there so that when she would dig she'd get in contact with the chicken wire and she didn't like it on her feet so she would stomp. Another thing that you can do that I have done successfully is in order to break them of digging is you, whenever they poo in the backyard, take their poo and fill the holes that they dig with it. That makes them not want to dig. You want to not have them digging. If your dog is a digger and it ever gets through the fence, you can't have that dog in the backyard by itself ever again until you make sure that the fence line is, is not able to be dug through. Um, you also want to make sure that you train your kids dog safety. So if your kids are going in and out of the backyard or in and out of the house, that they close doors, that they close gates, that they're you know aware of the risk to your dog if it ever escapes. If you have company over, you need to make sure, you know, especially if they don't own dogs, you need to make sure that whoever comes into your house, you know, if it's a gardener, 
If a gardener goes in your backyard while your dog's back there, are they going to leave the gate open? You need to be very aware of your surroundings, your perimeter security, and the people that are coming in and out of your house because nine times out of ten, if your dog escapes the yard, it wasn't on your watch. It's, it's because a gardener came in or a dog walker or a husband mowing the lawn or a kid. It's, it's always somebody else's fault. So you need to be aware of what those somebody else's are doing. So let's say you saw your dog do it. You know, like maybe you were there, maybe you were watching your dog and the gardener comes in and opens the gate and right when he opens the gate, your dog takes off and, and scooches by him. That's, that's gonna be the easiest scenario because you can see where your dog went. Let's say it's the scenario where you were at home and you saw it happen. You saw someone come into your gate and as they were opening the gate, your dog ran out. Just as an example, it could be anything, but that's the example we're gonna go with. Well, if you saw it, don't run after your dog because running after them makes them want, they think that you're playing and they want to run farther and faster. They think you're playing the running game. Don't play the running game with them. Depending on your dog, there's a couple different things that may be effective. If you have a dog that's highly mood, uh, food motivated, before you go after your dog, go into your kitchen, grab some hot dogs or some cheese or whatever their favorite snack is and put those in your pockets. Then you want to keep an eye on your dog, but don't chase after them. If you can get your dog's attention with the happiest voice that you can muster and run in the other direction, like towards your house or towards the gate, a lot of dogs will follow you. Another tip that you can do is you can show them the treat. You can say, hey, do you want some chicken or do you want some cheese or, you know, this is your favorite. Do you want some treats? You know, a lot of dogs will come running for that too, especially if you have it in your hand and they can see it. Another thing that I stumbled upon is if your dog is playing with you, or even if it's not, if you make a loud noise and you fall to the ground, they will, come, they will come running back to you. And as soon as they come running back to you, you can grab them. How do I know this? I know this because I was watching a dog once years ago and the, it had a um, retractable leash. And it saw a bunny run across and it went after the bunny and right then the retractable leash, leash inside snapped and the leash broke, which is why I hate retractable leashes. I know that they're bad. I've had two of them break. So it, it broke and the dog went running off and this wasn't my dog. So it didn't care if I called, it hadn't been trained to recall. It didn't come when I called it. And I was terrified because this was not my dog and it, it had a broken leash and it was running down the street. Well, I was in those sweater Ugg boots. It was morning. I was just taking out for a little potty break. I hadn't planned on going very far. And I, it's, part of the leash was still attached to the dog but the piece inside had broken, so I had a handle and then it had a leash, it still had a leash on it. And I was just a couple steps away from the dog, so I, I wasn't trying to chase the dog, but I was trying to get my foot on the leash. And when I tried to make that over, overly big step to put my foot on the leash, I tripped. And when I tripped, I made a loud noise, you know, I made a grunt, and I fell to the ground. And when I fell to the ground and rolled, the dog ran right back to me to see what was going on. So I know that this works. I was also walking my own dog at the time. Both dogs in my face, licking my face, you know, and, it, and I just reached up and grabbed the dog, the, the piece of leash that was still attached to the dog. So I know that that works. Now, if your dog has taken off and it's not coming back when you call it and it's getting farther and farther away, but you can still see it, this is when I would grab my car keys and I would, and I would get in my car because you wanna keep your eyeballs on, on the, the dog. Once the dog gets out of your eyesight, it becomes a lot harder to retrieve them. So get in your car, drive slowly alongside the dog, and if this is your own dog and it loves to go for car rides, this is where it gets really easy. This has worked for strays too. When you pull up alongside the dog, park, you know, pull over and park, unless they're still on the move. If they're still on the move, keep following them. But at some point they're gonna slow, and they're gonna be sniffy, they're gonna check out some bushes. And this is when, I love this trick because it works so often. Go ahead and park, act happy, don't act mad, don't act like they're a bad dog, act like you're, this is all fun and games. They're having fun, you're having fun, everything's good. And like I said, this works on strays too. Open the door to the car, 
and say, hey, I'm gonna, I hate to say it around these two dogs because they're going to get all excited, but ask them if they want to go for a ride and say it in, in their, your happiest voice. Do you know how many dogs will just jump in the car? It's amazing. This works so well. But you just say, hey, do you want to go for a ride? You open the door and you do like you normally do when you're going to the park or you're going for a walk or going somewhere fun. And, and they'll hop in. And a stray that, that enjoys going for a ride, they're going to hop in just as fast. And this used to work all the time. And the thing is, if it's your own dog and you're driving alongside them, a lot of times they're going to come up to the car. You know, they've had their fun. They've done their exploring. They're going to come right up to your car and go like, hey, you're, what are you doing out here? You open the car door, they jump right in. They, you know, they don't know that what they've done was wrong or bad. They just think they're out being, being free and exploring and it's all good. You know, they don't know that they're in trouble until they see it with your demeanor. If you stay happy and friendly towards them, then a lot of times you can just get them to jump right in the car. You know, dogs have a way of doing what they want to do and maybe you just got the dog and it's scared. You know, when you first bring home a rescue dog, they're afraid and they will try to run away sometimes. And it's not because you're a bad owner. It's not because you did anything wrong. You know, you can't help it if the gardener comes when you're out there laying by the pool with your dog and they don't close the gate. I mean, that's that kind of stuff happens. And so you just have to kind of have it in the back of your mind, you know, what will I do if this happens? Because then if you have a game plan, you don't have to panic and freak out and figure out a plan when you're in the heat of the moment. You know, if you if you kind of run these scenarios through your head ahead of time and you have a game plan, then you can put that game plan into action much more quickly and it'll save your dog. That is what I recommend if you find a lost dog or if you lose your dog. If you have any other tips that I may have missed, please let me know. I would welcome more tips. I have a blog post that's a little more organized and less rambly that I've posted on my webpage about this same thing. If you'd like to check that out, I'll post the link in the description. But if you have any other ideas that have worked for you when you've either found or lost a dog, uh, please let me know. I hope this helps somebody. Have a great day.